Rochelle Naylor, who is an MD at the University of Chicago. Uh, she is an assistant professor of pediatrics and has a secondary appointment in the Department of Medicine. She has strong expertise in genetics of diabetes, specifically um, the monogenic forms or MODI. Uh, she has a long history of research now. Maybe she looks uh, younger than she is. She um, got her BS from the Alabama State University, where she participated in research through the MARC program. Um, and I'm not sure if we have any of our undergrads on, but we have a few MARC scholars that work at our Diabetes Institute here. She received her MD at Mayo Clinic and uh, or Mayo Med School, in Rochester, uh, Minnesota, um, before doing a residency and fellowship and then becoming a faculty member at the University of Chicago. She's a, an NIH funded young investigator currently with a K award that's focusing on Modi, her, ex, her, love, her uh, area of expertise. And today she's gonna talk to us about monogenic diabetes um, and the path to precision medicine. And as Mark had mentioned when he first jumped on, there are many people here that have significant interest in genetics of diabetes. And I think through the NPOD program, which your group has been involved with significantly, um, that has really helped us um, connect pathogenesis to genetics in the past with NPOD, specifically in helping us deal with what would be um, some complicated cases. So we are all looking forward to your seminar and, and thanks a lot for agreeing uh, to talk with us today. Yeah, no, it's definitely my pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. And I, um, I've hopefully left, you know, a, a decent chunk of time at the end for questions. Um, the way I'm going to go, you know, the, the, the title of my talk, Monogenic Diabetes, the Path from Diagnosis to Precision Medicine, is just um, take you on a little bit of the path um, that I've taken from the time in 2012 when I first started with the group that I'm working with. Um, and really the, my interest in diabetes and in genetics has sort of led me to each, to each study. I didn't really start out um, with a clear path beyond, I like the genetics of diabetes and we, seem, and we have a registry here at the University of Chicago and I wanna be a part of it, um, but really from being a part of that registry, the rest of the questions found me. So I'm gonna to just touch on a couple of them. Um, I, I, I don't wanna um, make this go too long because I really could wax poetic, but um, hopefully you'll all find this of interest. I do not uh, have any disclosures um, or um, um, any um, financial relationships to disclose. I will talk about sulfonylureas and the use of monogenic diabetes, which is not really off label. Although when you're thinking of adolescence or things, it, it can be. I always like just to frame this, so um, starting with just the scope of diabetes, we, we need to realize this is, the, or remember, and we all know it, but we always have to be cognizant that this is a really, really prevalent disease and a really significant um, uh, problem for our healthcare system. So more than 10% of the U.S. population have diabetes, and more than a third have prediabetes, and the thing is we, we know diabetes is a very costly disease. Um, these, these this estimate is actually from 2017. So we know it's even more costly now, um, a, a full five years later, um, over $327 billion um, annually to the US. And that is both direct medical cost, but also the reduced productivity from having a chronic medical condition. And despite all of this expense, we know that a lot of people aren't actually achieving their glycemic targets. We think that part of this is because diabetes is not one disease, rather it is many, and the heterogeneity in the cause of diabetes can make it really difficult to prescribe the right treatment at the right time. And so the thought is that one of the keys to improving outcomes is to be able to classify people better because then we can apply precision medicine. And we think that precision medicine itself, you know, getting the right therapy to the right person at the right time, that's going to improve outcomes. At least that's, that's, the, that's the hope. And so here, hopefully you can see my arrow, but the idea is that we take this heterogeneous group of people and we start to cluster by um, shared phenotypes and that clustering will be able to better inform what therapy we tell the patient to take, what management strategies, maybe even prevention strategies, depending on the, the type of um, diabetes we're talking about. 
And this is really the heart of the Precision Medicine and Diabetes Initiative that I'm sure um, many or all of you are familiar with and where I'm very um, fortunate to be participating in some of these efforts where, again, the idea is that through um, applying the appropriate treatment for the appropriate person at the appropriate time, we're going to help people living with diabetes realize a future of longer, healthier lives. And even early on um, in their very first consensus statement, the Precision Medicine and Diabetes Initiative recognized monogenic diabetes is actually one of the few areas where precision diabetes medicine has already been proven feasible and is practiced. I will say with the caveat though, that a lot of times we are still unfortunately missing it or, or not applying precision therapy, even when we know um, that we're dealing with monogenic diabetes. But I like to use it as a nice exemplar of, of getting to this path of accurate diagnosis and then to precision therapy. So as a reminder for monogenic diabetes, it's not a large portion of the diabetes um, um, population, about 0.4% of all diabetes will be due to monogenic causes. But if you're looking at people who are diagnosed under 30, then it's as much as 3.5%. And there are two main clinical phenotypes, neonatal diabetes and MODI. And I will be focusing on MODI or maturity onset diabetes of the young, this autosomal dominant form of young onset diabetes. I like to take a number of um, slides from the consensus statement from the Precision Diabetes and Medicine Initiative because I just think they nicely lay out what we're hoping to do, right? We're really hoping to get to precision diagnostics. So taking the, the phenotypic data um, that someone presents with, looking at the epidemiology of diabetes classification, and then figuring out who warrants what sort of test to get to as accurate a classification of their diabetes as possible. And really in this case, we're thinking, who warrants genetic testing? I'm not actually gonna spend that long on that question. Um, I'll, I'll just remind you of features that should make you think of genetic testing before I really talk about how I first really dived into Modi through the University of Chicago um, Monogenic Diabetes Registry. So remembering um, when we are thinking of diet, who should be tested for Modi, um, we know that the difficulty is that there is a lot of clinical overlap between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And this table here lists really the most common types of MODI that we're thinking of, and, and particularly ones that are clinically actionable, where you're going to change your management. Um, but you, even though there's overlap, there are some things we can think of, right? So we are typically thinking of type 2 diabetes as being something that comes on with older age and usually um, with the clear risk factor of obesity. Obviously, not every patient remembers to read the textbook, but this is obvious. This is typically what we are thinking when we're thinking type 2. And so a lot of times people with MODI, it's not that being overweight excludes you from being from having MODI, but certainly if you're normal weight and presenting with um, what is not insulin dependent diabetes, you want to start to think about these the potential of MODI causes. We know in type 1 diabetes, this is usually an autoimmune process. It's almost always marked by the presence of antibodies. So that's a nice biomarker to figure out who may in fact have MODI rather than type 1 diabetes, again, identifying someone for genetic testing. Unlike type 1 diabetes, where you're expecting there to be very low C peptide levels because um, endogenous insulin function is compromised, we're expecting those things to be normal and monogenic forms. And then because this is by definition autosomal dominant, we're also looking for strong family history. And it really gets down to this bottom line where if we can figure out people who have MODI, it's going to impact their therapy. And we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but I want to step back and say, you know, how did I get involved in all of this? And I've alluded to it already, but I did my training at the University of Chicago um, after a my PEDS residency in a, in a chief resident year, I joined our fellowship and I have always really liked genetics. When I was, um, we were earlier on talking about my time at NIH, I was working in a genetics lab um, that was focused on, you know, what's called Aldrich syndrome, but I just liked the idea of um, doing something in the arena of genetics, but that would, would really keep me very patient focused where, where um, there was an immediate impact on, on patient care from whatever genetic knowledge I might glean about a condition. And so um, being at the University of Chicago where there's a rich history of research in, in diabetes genetics, you know, I was, I was in the right place def definitely. Um, and so I reached out to um, doctors Graham Bell and, and Lou Phillips and, and Dr. Greeley was 
you know, he was my senior resident when I was an intern, so sort of already had a nice in um, and, and asked to work with them in, in, in monogenic diabetes. And actually, at the time that I joined them, we only had the neonatal diabetes registry as our official registry. But what we had at that time in 2012 was a, was a spreadsheet, a literally an Excel spreadsheet. Um, of, and it had a couple of names on there where the people um, had reached out um, based on the um, uh, sort of the, the reputation of the neonatal diabetes registry to say, hey, I don't have that. I wasn't diagnosed you know, as a neonate, but I've got something. You know, My whole family has diabetes. My doctor's scratching his head. It's not type one, it's not type two. We're not sure what it is. And that led to a renewed interest in Modi. You know, and Dr. Graham Bell had been involved um, in some of the early discoveries in the 1994 through, you know, 90, 96, 98 in, in the Modi genes, but really it had sort of gone, oh, this is really interesting. And then no one had really thought about it that much at the university uh, until um, the neonatal diabetes registry started and all of a sudden patients were finding us. And so when I came, as a, came in as a fellow, I said, oh, well, I want to do what we do with the neonatal di diabetes registry with, with these people who have Modi. And, you know, about one or two double IRBs later, we realized it was really silly to have two really, really complementary registries doing the exact same thing. And so they got merged into what is now our monogenic diabetes registry. Um, I, I do have our, our, our website there, certainly any, any patient or, or anybody, you know, we, we would love to have patients referred. Um, the idea here is that there is strength in numbers and in something that is uncommon. So if we can kind of collate people in one place, it, it allows for other researchers to um, recruit for their studies. And it also allows us to, to um, kind of describe the US experience um, with, these, with these subforms of monogenic diabetes. Um, we recently published this um, paper in Frontiers on our, our registry. Um, we have what I like to call a legacy registry. Legacy sounds fancy. What it really means is we started it early and didn't know what we were doing. And so um, we've, we've adapted over the years from, as I mentioned, an Excel spreadsheet where you we would literally have to say, huh, do I have the most recent version of this spreadsheet that I'm about to update with this new patient information um, to now having our registry housed in REDCap. Um, and and we've, we've really been able to grow the registry nicely over years. Um, this, this kind of walks you through what it looks like if, if you have a patient or if you are a patient who's interested in the registry. People are either self-referred or they're referred from their healthcare provider. And they, you know, a lot of times people just find this by web searching. Um, we have a registration, a secure registration form on our, on our website. They put in their information that goes to a group email. We all can see like, you know, we get it, we get a bing, someone has registered on the website and then um, our registry coordinator reaches out, gets some more information and does a phone screening and eligible, eligibility consent. Um, there are times that people aren't in, are not eligible for the registry. Often they are eligible for other studies. And so this has been a nice place to be able to refer people to other programs. One in particular is the Radiant study where um, I'm looking at rare and atypical diabetes. Um, and those who are eligible actually complete a baseline survey. They're, all of their data is, is stored securely in the REDCap database. And then we try to um, walk them through the process of genetic testing. A lot of the times the genetic testing actually ends up being, in, being done in our registry. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on that more, um, but you know, we encourage people to get commercial testing, you know, clinical testing. This is a clinical diagnosis. Um, there are a lot of commercial labs who do the genetic testing. This really should be something that's ordered in the clinical space. But a lot of times, unfortunately, there's insurance barriers to, to that happening. Um, and so uh, we do a fair amount of genetic testing through the registry for those individuals who cannot get the testing done otherwise. And then we follow people. We follow you know, those where we confirm a diagnosis of monogenic diabetes, and we follow those people where we haven't been able to confirm it. And, and again, a lot of times we're able to refer them to additional studies um, to try to get at exactly what is causing their diabetes. We, we cast a pretty broad net. So you know, I'm certain that some of the people in our registry have um, whatever it is we mean when we say type two diabetes and other people um, have something that is waiting to be discovered, either a truly new gene or more likely just a mechanism of, of, um, of diabetes that we haven't recognized in one of the genes. Rochelle? Yes. 
Can I ask you a question? And again, I could let you just keep going and you're doing oh, an yeah, amazing no. job. Yeah, I'd say please. I, I, love uh, I just have a question, meaning like, like um, 10, 15 years ago, nobody thought about this. Five years ago, people recognized it. And then when you have these boxes and you're talking about self-repural or uh, provider, I mean, what are you doing in terms of trying to increase awareness in this area? And do you feel like it's happening or is it still like um, uh, the great unknown? Uh, and if I'm not explaining that, well, I, I'm very sorry. No, no, I think I understand the question. And I think it's a little bit in between. So definitely, you know, um, I've been fortunate to, you know, like like things like this. I get to I get to talk. I get to remind people about monogenic diabetes if it's not at the forefront of their mind. Of course, at your university, it really is. But you know, sometimes I'm talking at other places where people really um, have heard of it and maybe said like, "Oh, mm, this this doesn't really happen." And after talking, will reach out to me or reach out to colleagues. Definitely, we see an uptick of people reaching out around Indo society and around the ADA and, you know, those opportunities when, when we kind of get a chance to tickle people and, re, and they remember like, oh, I had that patient where I was thinking about this. Um, there are definitely though, I think there are, there are gaps. There are, there are definitely provider gaps um, in terms of sometimes patients are the ones who know something is wrong and they can't necessarily get the provider to either um, agree that there's something interesting about their diabetes and maybe needs more evaluation or the provider agrees but doesn't know what to do. Um, I think, you know, word of mouth is getting out more and more. We definitely get um, a lot of inquiries from physicians um, all the time and, fr and from, from diabetes providers all the time, which I think is a wonderful thing and a good sign. Um, but we still get a lot of, um, it's not uncommon to have um, patients who have been been asking, you know, one of their providers have sought another provider, you know, to, to really get to the answer and sometimes um, do face a lot of difficulty. And then the truth of the matter is, um, you know, even in the research community, um, people are like, well, we all know what Modi is now. It's, it's all solved. And I'll, I'll you know, um, share just a couple of my experiences where I would say, no, it's not all solved. Uh, we the, probably, you know, the biggest issue is really getting people to the diagnosis. And then once you get them to the diagnosis, getting them to the right therapy. So we're somewhere in between, you know, we, we've got a, a decent awareness, but I think um, that awareness is a little bit siloed and, and, and particularly in places where there's not a lot of subspecialist um, or major academic centers, it can be very difficult for patients to navigate just getting to the diagnosis or, you know, really just getting someone to, to order the genetic testing, assuming it would be covered by their insurance. So, Within the registry, um, since its inception, we have had a steady um, enrollment rate. Um, so you, we can see here where we started in 2008 with just the neonatal registry, and it was about um, a, a bit later. And I realized I've been saying 2012 for my fellowship because apparently I think I'm younger than I am. Fellowship started in 2009 and ended in 2012. And so the um, Modi registry came online right about here and you can see this nice uptick and we mostly have Modi because Modi is more um, common than the neonatal diabetes so even though the neonatal registry started um, in advance we have most of our, our participants with Modi so just a little over or a little under 4,000 people in the registry but in terms of those who have a known cause just a little over a thousand um, and part of that discrepancy some of it's just that people um, either are not going to end up having um, a single gene cause of their diabetes. Certainly, I'm, I'm certain we have some people um, like that in the registry. Um, other people may have a cause that is yet to be discovered. And then some of these are our, our family members where we actually don't necessarily expect them to have a cause. And this is particularly true in neonatal diabetes um, where these are very often going to be spontaneous. And so um, not every family member who's enrolled is actually going to be expected to carry a gene cause. But we've, we've managed to you know, um, have um, just, again, over a thousand people where we have a known cause of their diabetes and we are able to look at these people in cohorts and, and um, learn additional insights into the specific forms of monogenic diabetes. One of the things that's 
really important to see um, about, about this. This is just laid out again, um, our, gene, our gene causes. GCK really um, clearly is our, our top one here. Um, and then HNF1 alpha Modi is our second most common form. Worldwide, that's flipped. Um, usually HNF1 alpha is the most common, um, followed by GCK. But there are countries like ours where GCK is the most common. Um, in the UK, HNF1 alpha is the most common, but in a number of countries, um, GCK really is the most common. Whether there is an ascertainment bias there or not, it's hard to tell. I will tell you, um, people with GCK, Modi, are usually the ones who really um, know that they know that something's off about their diabetes. I, I um, like to tell this anecdote where I remember um, years ago I was on service and I don't know how someone managed to get to my service pager, but they did. And it was a mother and she said, I don't, I don't know who else to call. I found you web searching. She's like, I, um, I don't know what my two sons have. They're supposed to have type one diabetes, but I just learned neither of them have been taking their insulin um, for months and months and months. And, you know, and it, Turned out this mother who, you know, again, managed to somehow get to my service pager on a Saturday was completely right. Both her sons had GCK Modi um, and they had stopped their insulin because at some point they realized like their doctor was wrong. And even though no one was listening to them and saying, no, no, you just, you need your, your insulin, they, they, they knew better. So I think some of that may be that people with GCK Modi um, kind of have the easiest time of realizing something is not right. My diagnosis is incorrect or it may be the true the true prevalence, but we don't we don't really know. One All of the right. things. So we're uh, shifting yeah. mark again. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna approach you on that. Um, so you're saying that you've got your nice little left to right figure here. If you had to take reorder this in terms of um, either A1C difficulty in managed men of diabetes rather than number of our participants, how would this sort out and does that meaning the degree of I don't want you to call it uh, metabolic dysregulation difficulty in management diabetes do you how much do you think that that influences referrals to your to your center yeah I think yeah so the the thing is um People, a lot of times people will, will sell Modi as being, you know, mild diabetes and easily controlled. That's not necessarily true for HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha, um, certainly not for HNF1 beta, which has a lot of, um, you know, it, it really has multi-organ, um, um, uh, mul multiple organs that are affected and, and really um, the diabetes can be difficult, certainly um, the large proportion of people with HNF1 beta Modi are on, on insulin. So anything that, that's going to go on insulin and be responsive to it, I, I think it, it makes it much more difficult to um, parse it out from type 1 diabetes. So since 1 alpha, 4 alpha, 1 beta, um, the transcription factor Modi, they're all coming on at, you know, adolescents to young 20s. And oftentimes people are um, normal weight and, and you start them on insulin and their diabetes responds. And so I think it's really easy for that just to look like type one diabetes. Um, and people with one alpha and four alpha where they're so they're very sulfonylurea responsive, right? So if you happen to start them on a sulfonylurea and they're very sensitive, that will sometimes be the thing that alerts physicians. And we'll talk about that, you know, their therapy a little bit more. Um, but if you put them on insulin, they're not necessarily particularly more, more sensitive, more responsive than someone with type one diabetes. So it's very easy to miss. I think GCK Modi is the form of diabetes that act, that acts the most different. I mean, it really is different amongst all kinds, including the Modis. And so I think those patients who have GCK Modi, um, are the one, and particularly if they're put on insulin, they're the ones who realize that something is going on because they can either do everything and have their A1C not budge, or they can do nothing at all and have their A1C not budge. And, and, and I think they're, they're the ones who really recognize something is, is going on. And I'll give them one, just a single person example of, of what it means to, be, to do everything with GCK Modi and to do absolutely nothing with GCK Modi um, when it comes to diabetes management. Did that answer your question? So, um, yeah, if I can repeat uh, my, uh, and just uh, come to a conclusion. So you'll say that the GCK form of diabetes is of such severity that it 
Uh, it may be that it's the most common, but in addition that the sequelae, the symptomatology is enough that it also leads to referrals. No, uh, let me clarify. Yeah, no. So okay. I think that what really, so with GCK, I think one of the reasons we pick this up is actually that it's so mild that patients are the ones who realize they must not have whatever they were told they have. So right. a lot of times, that, yeah. That's what I was trying to say. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I, oh, I okay. just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they, they understand something's not right. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Yes. I, yes. I just misunderstood what you're saying, but exactly right. Patients realize I am doing so well, doing really nothing at all, or I'm doing so I'm doing everything and nothing's changing in my A1C and they realize something's wrong. So I think that is part of what helps them. They pick themselves up and then they kind of, you know, either their doctor goes, oh yeah, you're right. And refers them on, or, you know, they're persistent and, and you know, and, and find their way to, to the diagnosis. With one alpha and four alpha, I do think it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's more difficult if they, particularly if a patient is immediately started on insulin, um, people may not put it together again until someone hears their family history and stops and pauses and goes, how many people have, have diabetes? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things about the registry, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, talk about one of the first things, um, you know, one of the, one of the first areas that I worked on as a, as a fellow and young faculty um, that sprung out of the registry. And like I mentioned, my, the questions have sort of found me. Um, but one of the things that we looked at when we look back at our, at our registry after doing this for, you know, about a decade is that about two thirds um, of people who get to their genetic um, diagnosis did so by research-based genetic testing, almost all of it out of our own lab because of the difficulties they have in getting this um, in, the, in getting this testing covered from their insurance companies. And that leads to significant delays um, for people over a decade sometimes um, between the time that someone first thought something was going on, um, a lot of times specifically that someone has mentioned the word Modi, but then, you know, before they actually get to the genetic testing to get the diagnosis. We have seen that in the last six years, um, about 59% of registry participants are getting their diagnosis through research-based te testing versus the six years prior to that, where it was 71%. So we are moving in the right direction, but for something, particularly when we're talking about the most common forms of Modi where they're clinically actionable, for something that is clinically actionable and for the number of commercial labs that do Modi testing to have this much difficulty is really still something that has to be tackled. And so, that led me to actually do cost effectiveness analysis testing early, um, pretty early when I started. And I'm, I'm not starting with the very first um, study that I did. I'm, I'm actually focused on one that I've done more recently with one of our, um, um, he was a Pritzker medical student, Matthew Goodsmith, and he's now one of our medicine pediatric residents in, um, in our training program. We were lucky to have him stay at the University of Chicago. Um, but it's really trying to make the case to, rem to remind insurance companies and basically to give um, you know diabetes providers a, a paper to cite when they're doing their prior authorization trying to convince the, um, the insurance companies to, to cover genetic testing and so what we did for this study is we actually used the search data the search study you know this is a study of diabetes in, in pediatric patients and we used their data because they had systematically looked for Modi in their you know, epidemiologic cohort. So it was a nice uh, study to be able to look at this and, and specifically to look at it in the US context. And we said, if we can figure out who needs, you know, someone who likely has monogenic diabetes and, and then test them, how much does this cost the healthcare system? Are we, you know, is it reasonable to ask insurance companies to pay for this? And so this is, this is a decision tree and it's a bit busy, obviously. I don't need you to read the fine print. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the, the big highlights. The point is that we use the search data to look at this question in pediatric patients. And we said, if you are a pediatric patient and you do not have autoantibodies that would suggest you have type 1 diabetes, and if you do have C-peptide, so you're still making, you're, you're still making insulin, um, then you warrant a small per percentage of the population, about 15%, who should go on to get testing for Modi. And whenever you're doing cost-effectiveness analysis, what you're looking at is um, sort of the 
option of doing this testing with a counterfactual. What happens if you if if no one gets testing? This was really nice because, of course, in the re in the real world, if you're not sure what a patient has, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily putting them on insulin. So we were able to look at what people were on, and that's what we modeled in our in our cohort. So we didn't say, well, everybody clearly has you know, they're pediatric and if they don't get diagnosed with Modi, they're all on insulin. No, we looked at what they were actually on and, and kept them on that. You know, we compared that scenario, keeping them on that if, they, if they've never made the diagnosis compared to actually making the diagnosis. For the modeling, we assume that everybody who got diagnosed with GCK Modi would not have any therapy. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, but the but people with GCK Modi, they don't need treatment. So that's what we modeled. And then for, for sulfonylureas, we modeled the fact that they would go on to be treated with the sulfonylurea, which is the first line therapy for, sulfon for HNF1 alpha and HNF4 alpha Modi. But in this study, we also modeled the fact that some of those patients over time would fail therapy, which is exactly what happens. And after doing this simulation to look, the, the thing that I wanna draw your attention to in this this table one that's showing the outcomes, I really want to draw your attention to this negative sign. So, and this negative sign, what this means is that when we look at the cost effectiveness analysis of doing genetic testing after selecting a population based on their biomarkers, right? So selecting a population that's, that has a decent chance of having MODI, that it actually is cost savings. So this means we are saving money and it's because we're improving people's quality of life because they are not having the same treatment burden, particularly if they have GCK Modi, and because we're improving their outcomes if they have HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha and are switched from insulin or other therapies to sulfonylureas to which they're um, particularly sensitive. And, and that sensitivity translates into improved hemoglobin A1Cs and in, improved diabetes control, which then decreases diabetes related complications. So we actually save money when we make this diagnosis. And this includes all of the people who would have gotten the genetic testing, but not been positive for Modi. So we're putting a lot of money up front, but after 30 years, we actually recoup these costs in our healthcare system. Additionally, because Modi is an autosomal dominant disorder, if we diagnose one person, then we can actually go back to their family and correct a lot more diagnoses at a substantially smaller cost. Because if I have Modi, maybe I spent $2,000 in order to get the genetic testing. But then once I have my variant, my family member is going to spend about a tenth of that to just confirm that they have the exact same variant that I do if they have diabetes. So when we can add in cascade testing where we go and find the first degree relatives of the proban, we enhance our cost savings. So again, realizing in medicine, we almost are never saving costs, right? Vaccines is a place where we save costs. It costs a lot less to vaccinate than to get a disease. Um, but most of the time, everything else, we are spending money to increase quality of life. In this case, we are actually saving money and increasing a quality adjusted life here. So that's an unusual scenario. And it is, is important, it was important work to do. Um, again, just, just to have a, a paper to cite <laughs> when you're putting out those prior authorizations and asking the insurance company to, to cover the testing, but because, because it actually is beneficial for the healthcare system. It's beneficial to correct a diagnosis of type one diabetes if they really have Modi. It's beneficial to not do all of the surveillance that goes along with type one diabetes. And it's beneficial to not use insulin therapy if you don't need it. So I like always to like to say a few notes whenever I talk about genetic testing, um, because sometimes people will leave a talk and they'll go like, ooh, there is a patient who I've been meaning to get this genetic testing on. So I, I never fail to give everybody the sort of the dues. One is, you know, you should try to use a CLIA certified lab. Um, on a research basis, we do this testing. Of course, we do the exact same testing as a CLIA certified lab, but really from a sort of best practices, um, you know, it, it's most ideal that our patients get their testing from CLIA certified clinical labs. Most academic based um, centers have the ability to test for MODI, and then there's tons of commercial options. Um, obviously, commercial options because they're making profits, their pricing can often be more competitive than an, than an academic center's. Um, but regardless of where a patient goes, you must get a prior authorization. The worst thing to have happen is to suggest a patient get 
genetic testing to have them get it and then have them let you know that they just received a bill for you know anywhere from two to five thousand um, dollars and you don't want to forget about copays because um, again if testing if the testing cost is four thousand dollars and their copay is 10 to 20 percent for some families that is an absolute no-go um, it is important to know that most of the commercial labs have um, payment plans or assistant plans but often the patients have to ask about those first they can't they can't ask ask about them after the fact. Um, and then the other thing that I cannot um, emphasize strongly enough is that if there's any confusion about the genetic test report, and I feel like the genetic test reports are sometimes written, um, you know, for me, they might as well be in Greek because um, it's really hard to interpret what, the, what they're trying to say on the genetic test report. So I, my, myself and everybody else in our, in our monogenic diabetes um, group is happy to help with with reporting with interpreting genetic test reports we have had um occasions where people come to us theoretically with the diagnosis of modi and management changes have been made only to find that the variant um that they have is is, is not actually pathogenic we ourselves have gone back over time and realized um early on variants that we thought were pathogenic we were wrong as well you know we have curation data um, that um, continues to get refined, um, particularly through ClinGen ran um, the monogenic group ran by Tony Pullman at the University of Maryland. So, so sometimes that variant calling is not clear. And so these are just the things that I always like to highlight whenever I open my mouth to mention genetic testing for Modi. I'm going to switch gears now, and I've been alluding to treatment, um, but I'm going to switch gears and specifically talk about precision therapeutics for Modi, right? So the whole idea that we already talked about is this the idea of identifying people, um, kind of clustering them and trying to get to as precise a classification of their diabetes as possible and allowing that to dictate your therapy choices. And I'm gonna really focus on the three forms, the three most common and the three most clinically actionable forms of Modi that I've already been alluding to, to really bring this to the precision treatment piece um, that my title alluded to, right? So the idea of precision diagnostics is to be able to do precision therapeutics, in this case for Modi, and eventually for all forms of diabetes. So we're going to talk a little bit about 1-alpha and 4-alpha Modi. I'm not, I'm not going to tie this to specific um, research that I've done, um, because in the interest of time, I wanted to save that for GCK Modi. Um, but as I mentioned already, 1-alpha is the most common cause, and I will do that a lot. I will just take away the HNF 1-alpha, and I'll put 1-alpha, so you you know that I mean HNF 1-alpha Modi, um, if, I, if you find me doing that. Um, it is the most common cause worldwide. HNF4 alpha is significantly less common at about only 5% of all Modi cases, but these forms look very similar. So a lot of what I say for HNF1 alpha Modi is also true for HNF4 alpha Modi, but not entirely. Both of these cause a progressive defect in glucose dependent insulin secretion. So you end up with young onset diabetes. And for somebody who actually knows they're at risk for this, um, say because their family already has a diagnosis of HNF1 alpha Modi, you can actually follow them over time with oral glucose tolerance tests and you will, you will see this deterioration happen in real time. Because their problem is secretion, they actually will typically have their fasting blood sugars look just fine. And so if you do an OGTT, you'll see that their fasting blood sugar is just fine, but they have a really significant rise um, to their two hour mark because of, because again, the problem is, is really with the insulin secretion. And like other forms of diabetes, they are at risk for microvascular and macrovascular complications. And this is tied to their glycemic control, but it also, at least for HNF1 alpha Modi, seems to be tied to something else that the HNF1 alpha um, 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 heter heterozygous variant is doing. Because we know that if we look at people who have HNF1 alpha Modi, their cardiovascular risk and deaths are higher than their non-affected family members. So um, I like to point that out because these patients often are thin, um, maybe by ascertainment bias of who gets Modi testing, but they are thin and they also have a lipid profile that will typically make us think, oh, your lipids look really great because their HDL often is, is it's certainly preserved, certainly normal, unlike we may see for type two diabetes where it often is low. And so you might look at it and say, your lipids look great, but there's an independent cardiovascular risk factor inherent to the HNF1 alpha variant itself um, that's not fully explored, but is a reason to put them on, on statin therapy. 
I, with this cartoon, just want to remind people um, where, um, where Sylvania reads act and why um, these are first line therapy and really precision medicine for people who have um, variants in the HNF1 alpha or HNF4 alpha genes causing MODI. So HNF1 alpha um, and HNF4 alpha really regulate their transcription factors. They regulate a lot of, they have a lot of different targets, but the main, one of their main um, targets really is, is going to be insulin secretion. And you can see um, there are a number of processes that are interrupted um, when you have mutations in this gene, but if you can bypass them by activating um, um, the SIR1 receptor with sulfonylureas, you can actually bypass a number of the things that go wrong when you have variants. Um, we have pathog pathogenic variants in these genes. And so both of these forms of diabetes are quite sensitive to sulfonylureas. Um, maybe one alpha more than four alpha, it's hard because of the sheer differences in numbers, it's, it's hard to settle that, but both should be considered to be sensitive to sulfonylureas. So much so that typically if we are taking somebody and starting them on sulfonylureas, um, we are gonna start with a quarter to a half tab um, because they can be quite sensitive. So sometimes people will tell you that they've failed sulfonylureas and you have to probe to say, what do you mean? And if they say, oh, because I was so hypoglycemic, that actually adds to your suspicion that maybe I was thinking of Modi and I'm still thinking of Modi because now they've told me they failed, but what they meant is they couldn't tolerate it. Um, some patients are so sensitive that even once you get down to a quarter tab, they are actually still hypoglycemic on a sulfonylurea. And that makes semoglutinide a good alternative treatment because they find the same receptor, but not with um, and with um, a little less affinity. So, so they don't cause quite as much hypoglycemia as the sulfonylurea sometimes can. But this is the first line therapy and, and therefore precision medicine for diagnosing these forms of diabetes. And what um, a tertiary um, care center in Ireland has been able to show is that when you, um, and, and other studies have showed this as well, is that when you take people and you transition them off of insulin therapy or other therapies and onto sulfonylureas, you are usually getting a nice decrement in your hemoglobin A1C, again, because they are specifically sensitive to sulfonylureas. And that A1, that um, better glycemic control, just as we would assume it would, it actually translates into less complications. So this is really important in, in again, getting to the diagnosis, but then making sure you're acting on the diagnosis. There are other um, therapies that have been looked at and um, studied for both HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha. And so certainly if you need um, an alternative or an adjunctive therapy, both the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors have been shown to be effective in that regard. I'm gonna switch gears and, and, and we'll end with thinking about GCK Modi. Um, I think GCK Modi is maybe my favorite um, type of monogenic diabetes to think about because it's really fascinating um, because it, um, to call it diabetes almost feels like it's a misnomer, right? So GCK Modi is, is, is due to um, heterozygous mutations in the GCK gene. The GCK gene um, encodes glucokinase. Glucokinase um, is an enzyme and is the first step in glucose metabolism. People who have heterozygous inactivating mutations in GCK have a raised set point for when they're going to secrete insulin, but everything else is intact. So they, if they're sitting at a blood sugar of say hundred, their body is sending no signals. Their, 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 their beta cells don't sense the need to do anything. But once you hit their threshold, maybe 120, everything, all steps of glucose metabolism proceed normally. They also counter regulated that at a higher set point. So if, if the blood sugar maybe gets into the the 70s, they're, they're really starting to do to, to discrete the counter-regulatory hormones. So they have a genetically set higher um, uh, fasting glucose, and that translates into a higher hemoglobin A1C, but everything else is doing what it's supposed to do. And so what this looks like is that if you take the population of people who do not have GCK Modi mutations, but are their relatives of people who do, you can see here is their A1C is plotted over time with age. There's some deterioration as it happens in, in all of us. And then you see the people with GCK Modi, these lines are really superimposable. You just have to shift one down. And that's exactly what GCK Modi is. Their, 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 glucose, their, their blood sugars and their A1Cs are just simply shifted up to their set point. 
they do not, unlike all other forms of diabetes, including the other MODI forms, they are not at increased risk for micromacular vascular complications. They're very exceedingly rare in GCK MODI. And really in a study of people who were on average 50 years old, which means 50 years of mildly elevated blood sugars, the only complication they saw was background retinopathy that required no therapy at all. So really for GCK, when we think about precision medicine for it, precision medicine is no medicine outside of pregnancy, which I'm gonna to touch on. The reason I say I, I really love to think about GCK Modi is because um, it's really hard for providers not to do anything, right? And sometimes it's hard for patients who've been used to doing things um, to not do anything. And so I think I, I, I spent a lot of my time pondering what it is like, um, not just to care for these patients, but to also be one of these patients who have been doing everything and suddenly don't need to do anything at all. And I will tell you, it's a bit of an existential crisis for at least about half of them. The other half were like, I knew my doctor was crazy and they're, they're happy to do nothing. But there's, about, there's a good proportion who really struggled with this idea that they, they don't need to do anything. So Michelle, it's, it's Mark again, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. to keep interrupting you. Uh, and again, this is not a new concept for me, but um, yeah, that, the controversy uh, that you're talking about here, um, it does seem to hang on. And if you go back a slide, is there anything new, um, uh, either genetic wise or, or uh, age wise or race wise to explain this? this phenomena. Uh, and if you agree, maybe phenomena is not, might not be the best word, but you know, it does, did rub against what we thought about diabetes. You would agree, correct? Absolutely, right. It is, it is, it is a really difficult concept because on the one hand, there seems to be no, no lower threshold for like A1C and in its association with outcomes, even in the, in the population of people who don't have diabetes and yet in GCK Modi, there seems to be none of these complications that we're worried about. Um, I think so much of it has to do with when we start to look at why people have the A1Cs they have, um, then we're looking at the other genetic components to where we sort of all sit. And some of those start to, um, um, what's the word I want to say, kind of co-segregate with with our genes for insulin resistance or, or insulin sensitivity, however you want to look at those. And, and so there's, but there's not a clear explanation. There's only, you know, the collective cohort data, which a lot of people will find reassuring and other people will say, but there's not enough data. And that, and that is the difficulty, right? Because the, the, at the end of the day, the numbers are still small and the studies, you know, um, there, there's only, there's really the, the, the Exeter study, the, the UK study that, that we hang this data on. Now there are other studies, including our own registry, where our, our um, cohorts outcomes, you know, recapitulate this data as well, but there is not, you know, paper after paper after paper after paper. And we're telling people like, just go off and kind of ignore this altogether, except in pregnancy. It, it, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, um, hard for everybody to get comfortable with. I will say personally, what I do with patients who have GCK Modi is I see them one time a year and I'm like, we'll check your A1C. It'll make us both feel good. Um, I'm treating myself a little bit. I'm treating any anxiety they have, but you know, truthfully, um, even that really is technically not necessary. And yet my, I, I spend a lot of my time talking people out of, of treating GCK Modi, but even I still feel the need to at least see one data point that makes me, me comfortable. So. But right now there's, there's nothing new that, that um, explains this phenomenon. There are, there are also people who really do, um, you know, there, there are people who seem to really um, respond better to carb restriction than other people. And you can, you know, you can, you can change the A1C, you know, the party line is you don't, doesn't matter. Therapy doesn't change anything. Um, but I can also change my A1C and I don't have diabetes. I don't have GCK. I can, if I, eat strict and crazy enough, I can change my A1C. And maybe that translates into me living a week longer, but I'd frankly rather, 
you know, eat bread. And <laughs> so, so it's that, it's that sort of trade-off. We can make some difference. We could give people enough insulin to make them feel terrible. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. I'll just touch on that briefly and affect their A1C, or we can have people exercise and, and do um, crazy carb restrictions and change their A1C, but that's not exclusive to GCK Modi. That's, we all can do that. And if you, um, you know, have that much discipline, that's great. Um, but, but whether it translates into something meaningful for GCK Modi, there, there's, there's no evidence of that. Um, so just this cross-sectional study is showing um, for people who were misdiagnosed with a different type of diabetes, whether they were on oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin, once their diagnosis was corrected and they went off all therapy, the A1C did not change. Um, this is a cohort study. I love to, in addition to showing that cohort study, I love to show this graph because this graph um, is a person for me. I, I know this person by name. I've had conversations with this person. This person is in our registry. Um, and, I, and I really love this, this picture to, again, um, talk about that precision medicine for GCK Modi is no medicine. What you see for this individual who shared their CGM graphs is they're showing us this period from, you know, the first of Jan you know, month of data from 2015 in January, and then a month of data from 2015 in April. Um, and the red line, it, so first off, there's one thing to notice is just how flat this looks, right? No one no one's um, curves, maybe if they're not, if they're um, looping, maybe they can get their, their, their profiles to look like this, but this is pretty unusual for um, the diagnosis of type one diabetes that they carried. And then they got their Modi testing, having themselves gone like, I exercise, I count every carb, but my A1C is, you know, the more I do, it, it was 6.1%. The last time I did all of this extra stuff and it was 6.3 and then I did nothing at all. And, and it was, you know, 6.2. Um, what gives, and that's 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 what brought this person to us, and got the diagnosis. Went off all, you know, the insulin pump, all therapy, kept their Dexcom on to be able to give us this data. You can just really see that these lines are essentially the same line. So doing everything and doing nothing, and their A1C is really really steady. And so, you know, this is I, I always remember this this you know, this person and sort of, um, again, this is why people with GCK Modi usually find us because they're like, I'm doing everything and it's not making a difference. And if I do nothing at all, everything still seems the same. But like I mentioned, the exception is in pregnancy. In pregnancy, we actually, um, right now we, tr we, we base preg um, treatment rather off of what we think the baby has. If the baby has GCK, um, then we, then baby and mom don't, does, don't need therapy. If the baby does not seem to have the GCK mutation, then we treat mom um, on the behalf of the baby because mom still doesn't need the therapy. Most of the time we're actually basing this on whether or not the baby's, um, you know, is, is, is um, seeming large on, on ultrasound. So this is, we're making the decision like in the second trimester and then making it off of um, a proxy of what we think the genetic phenotype, is, the fetal genotype is. Eventually, I believe that we'll get to a point where we're gonna be able to use cell-free um, uh, fetal DNA to make this diagnosis and make these, di these decisions sooner. But until then, this is what we have. And I will end with just a, a quick um, study, and I know I'm quickly getting to time, so I'll go through this a little bit quickly. Um, this is just reminding people if someone's pregnant and mom has GCK, um, but baby doesn't, or, or and baby does as well when we treat with insulin, we can actually restrict growth or worry the baby will be small. If mom um, um, has GCK, but the baby doesn't, and we don't treat, we're worried about the baby being large from the insulin secretion that the baby will have. And so, you know, um, and then if the, um, in order to, to prevent that overgrowth, we want to treat with insulin. Um, again, we're inferring the phenotype most of the time. And I like to highlight this study, and I'm like I said, I'm going to end with this study where we look at what happened with people in our own registry who have GCK Modi. And the reason we did this study, we we're actually motivated to do it because there is still so much controversy. Myself and Dr. Dickens spend a lot of time talking to obst obstetricians about what they should do with a woman who has GCK Modi and trying to convince them to wait. Um, to treat until they get to the second trimester, trimester. But there are there are people who advocate and say, let's give insulin right away at the beginning to everybody just in case the baby has it. Um, and I just want to impress on people that that I'm not 
saying that that's not potentially reasonable, but I want to remind people that we've all decided that we would first do no harm to our patients. And when we treat people with GCK Modi, when we treat women who, who have, can get no benefit from the insulin without knowing that the baby is getting benefit, that sometimes we are doing harm. And so that's really what I wanted to show here. So we had um, 54 respondents, a total of 128 pregnancies. And really the part that I want to point out is even for those people who knew going into the pregnancy that they had GCK, you see how many people were actually on medication, particularly insulin, um, despite knowing right at the beginning that they had GCK Modi and should wait for those scans. And the other thing that I wanna point out um, is that these people, and I think I actually dropped, I realized I just dropped the slide. Um, my apologies, so the slide that really the take home point was this, of this was how much the mothers experienced hypoglycemia. Um, and I like to end with this point because again, I, I would say it's hard to do nothing. That's not what healthcare providers do. We like to give a therapy if we feel that something's wrong. It's hard to settle on the mild hyperglycemia of GCK Modi, but in these patients who received insulin treatment, the women, a number of women suffered a lot of hyperglycemia. One actually had to stop working because she was so hypoglycemic. Um, and ultimately, unfortunately, the insulin treatment does, didn't really um, do much to, to affect the birth size. So that's the other piece of it. It's very hard to change mom's blood sugars unless you really are kind of walloping her with, with, with insulin. And so very often, um, we're not really impacting the, the birth weight anyways. I do think with, with, um, with the use of cell-free fetal DNA, we could start early and we probably would have a better impact if we were able to start in the, in, you know, in the first trimester on behalf of baby. But until we're at a point where we're able to routinely use this, we have to remember we are otherwise doing a lot of harm to mom potentially and, and, and um, not even necessarily being able to affect the outcomes for babies the way we want to because of the timing that we have to start. Um, I'm gonna end here um, with take home points. And, and, the, and the first is just reminding, the whole point of getting to the precision di diagnosis is so that we can apply precision medicine. We think that if we can just better treat the diabetes types, people are going to have better outcomes. And so this correct classification is a critical first step to precision medicine. Um, hopefully I've, through these um, several examples, I've convinced you that monogenic di diabetes is a nice exemplar of precision medicine and really the lens that we should um, that we hopefully will be able to adapt more and more as we approach um, type one diabetes and type two diabetes and get a better sense of what those, um, of all of the diabetes types hidden in those, those broad umbrella terms. And then again, always consider Modi, right? If you have young onset diabetes, always consider it, convince yourself that you shouldn't do any genetic testing for it um, before moving on and deciding that it's a different diagnosis. I mentioned with the genetic testing, always get a PA and please get help with interpreting results if you have any uncertainty. And then once you make the diagnosis, make sure you then act on it and implement precision therapy of sulfonylureas for HNF1 alpha, 4 alpha, and deescalate your diabetes care and stop your therapy for GCK Modi. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm right at time, I know, I apologize, um, but I'm happy to stick around if people have time. And I'm also happy to receive um, any questions by email. Thank you very much. So we are live for questions. If anybody wants to, Mara, they can unmute themselves and, and show their faces on camera if they'd like to ask a question. Okay. Can I ask Mel a question, please? Melanie, this is Melanie, a, a really, really nice talk. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to see if you had any more comments on um, how other genetics in the background might be affecting patient outcomes. Like you're, you're kind of touching on how there might be uh, insulin resistance genetics that are kind of influencing uh, A1C that underlie these Modi genetics. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I will, it's actually such an important point because I will say, right, if someone has GCK Modi, but then they um, gain some weight, they, they actually see that their A1C that used to sit right at 6.2 or so starts to drift up, they're absolutely a candidate for metformin. Um, 
But part of what we have to remember is they're a candidate for metformin to probably get them back to the 6.2 that they started at. Um, sometimes we forget once we do start therapy because there's something, you know, another, another thing that we're treating, a separate entity that we're treating, um, sometimes we lose sight of what our, our targets should be. And our target should be their genetic set point. I actually have, and this also works um, the same in, in one alpha and four alpha. I have um, um, an adolescent um, who I treat who's going through puberty. And, you know, everybody is, is um, significantly insulin resistant during puberty. Yeah. And I started her on metformin because she just needs a little help. Her sulfonylureas are doing a really great job. I don't need to escalate to insulin. And I don't think I'm at a point of needing um, a DPP-4, a GPL-1 receptor agonist, she, but she's just, you know, clearly she's right in the, you know, the, the kind of peak of puberty and needs a little bit of help. And I started metformin and it's, and it's working beautifully. So there is definitely um, room, even in GCK Modi, um, for treating insulin resistance, but that is a separate thing, right? So if, the, if someone has GCK Modi in isolation, there really doesn't seem to be this, the same, um, there's not a benefit and there's usually not a response. So I've seen people who seem to have no insulin resistance um, kind of by their, the lack of acanthosis and nigricans, their weight, their sort of their lifestyle. And in historically those individuals, if they've been treated either because of misdiagnosis or again, because of that desire to do something at all, it, it, they're, it's not translating to anything in the hemoglobin A1C. Now, of course, most people on GCK Modi are not on CGM. So would it do something right. day to day in the variability? That's less explored. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think Melanie, that has probably a lot of a lot of concepts there entwined into type one diabetes where it's mostly monogenic as Graham Bell likes to tell us, but there are all these modifier genes that have an effect like HLA is the monogenic. Yes. Yep. Precisely. Yeah. That's you haven't heard him give that talk before? He's very convincing. I don't think I have. I feel like I would remember that. Yeah. We all have our Graham Bell stories. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So we have a question in the chat. Let's see here. Oh, Marin is telling yeah. us to please yeah. unmute. So I was going to ask you, so this maybe get, gets on what Melanie was talking about. So in the, you had a flow chart in one of your flow charts. Mm -hmm. um, you had a few modis that where the patients were treated with, there were different groups of patients maybe that were treated with or had the same modi, but they were getting different therapies. Mm -hmm. And is that physician induced or is that what regulates the therapy you receive if you have a specific type of Modi. Yeah. So in one of those flow charts, I think you're probably, um, it might be um, the, the cost effectiveness analysis actually is probably where the, right. the treatment. Right. and it is. So those were people before they got to their diagnosis. So they're, so they're treated with whatever their clinician decides, um, which that part I'm, I'm, I'm more, um, okay. It's not the right word, but I'm going to go with it. Um, right. I'm, I'm more okay. If you're like, something's odd about this patient, um, so I'm going to try these, these diabetes therapies, right? It's, it's like type two, where you just say, well, I'm going to try this one. And I usually will start with metformin and then we'll go from there if the control is not what we think. Um, the thing that's actually more alarming to me, and it's, it is the focus of my, my, um, my grant efforts currently is really that we actually have evidence in the registry of people who get to the genetic diagnosis, but then don't get to the precision therapy. And that I would say is really the problem. Early on before, when you're suspecting that the patient may have something other than standard type one or type two, whatever those are, um, then trying some different therapies, I think is really reasonable, right? It's, you know, it's the art of medicine. Um, but I think when you've got a monogenic diabetes diagnosis, there's a lot of science um, that really says these are what you should be on. And so when that doesn't, that doesn't happen with fidelity, and that's really sort of my next holy grail in this mission and where I'm really trying to like figure out what goes wrong. Um, you know, I, I have, um, you know, sort of antidote after antidote after antidote in the registry. Um, and I'm going to, you know, um, use qualitative methods to bring some more, um, some uh, more rigor to the, to the antidotes, you know, I'm really talking to both providers who've referred to the registry, which of course already is an ascertainment bias, but it's who I can get to, to know that they've, they've thought about this. Like, you know, hey, your patient had this. Why did you, 
why did you not change their therapy? Um, you met with your patient that you know you had you you had our genetic test report. You looked at it and you and you said and let's let's proceed as we've been doing. Or sometimes it's the patient who looks at it and says let's proceed as we've been doing. So that I think is um sort of definitely my my next area to tackle in my quest to go from <laughs> direct you know the correct diagnosis to then the correct therapy. <laughs> Coaching physicians to to do the right thing or give the right treatment. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost 10 minutes past too. Thank you so much. It's a fantastic talk. Thank you. We appreciate that you uh, would join us and you know, sorry you couldn't visit Gainesville in January, although our, <laughs> by our standards, the weather's crappy, so you may not have enjoyed it. Well, I will say, you know, like um, I'm in Chicago, so I think I'd be like, hey, what a nice treat. <laughs> so, but I, yes, I would have loved to have been there in um, person. Hopefully at some point in the future, I can be, but thank you so much for inviting me and for your attention. It's our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.